Hi, Phil Aston here from Now Spinning Magazine with another classic album review. And I've been asked to do this one several times and I'm going to be doing a lot more of these um, because I realise how popular they are. And this one looks at Richie Blackmore's Rainbow and the Rainbow Rising album, released in that hot summer of 1976. Great year for music. Um, you know, we've got Presence by Led Zeppelin. There was a lot going on in the Purple Camp as well, wasn't there? There was Ian Gillen Band had just been formed. There was news in the background about Pace Ashton and Lord. We've got Sarah Band by John Lord as, as well. Uh, Private Eyes, Tommy Bolin. Uh, we were going to see Made in Europe by the end of the year. Deep Purple had ground to a halt. And Richie Blackmore. There'd been so much anticipation about the follow-up album. The previous year in 75, I um, was Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, the first album, which I've covered on a video here before. And that was, it wasn't disappointing, but because of what been going on following Stormbringer and Come Taste the Band, there was a feeling that Blackmore was gonna really deliver the goods. And as much as I liked the first Richie Blackmore's Rainbow album, it didn't do what you expected. And so what was he going to do next? And this is prior to the internet and social media. So the only way we knew was from the press, really. Unless you were in the music business, that's the only way. And when I say the press, I mean literally sounds, melody maker, and new musical express, enemy. That was it. There might have been music scene, a couple of things, but really it was those, record mirror. And so the first thing I think we started to see was posters with this on, saying Rainbow Rising, the new album by Richie Blackmore. And as I said in the video I did um, as a tribute to Ken Kelly, the artist who put this together, just seeing that, I remember being at college, um, it was my first year as I left school in 75, so in 76 I was at college, and we always used to buy the music papers, well I did. And I saw this full page ad for this. And I just looking at that, I just thought that, you know, this is, it's going to be fantastic. It's just going to be fantastic. And the album was released in May of 1976. And there was, I, I, I've, I've said this before as well, that I was in a queue at Virgin Records. We all went to Virgin Records to buy it. You know, all catching the bus into Birmingham city centre and queuing up and a lot of my friends that I used to see in Bogarts and the Costa Munger and all these, you know, these kind of pubs. So many people I recognised in the queue were all queuing up to get this. And as we queued up to get to the decanter, we were all kind of looking at it because albums then weren't necessarily put in cellophane. They were just like this. And we were kind of looking at the pictures on the back and I mean, my mate Pete was going, wow, you know, that Jimmy Bain, he looks cool, doesn't he? I wonder what this is going to be like. And looking at the, the track listings and, um, and there was only two tracks on side two. What was that going to be like? And, um, you know, the picture in the front and just buying it because it was Richie Blackmore. Uh, and, you know, that, that was the thing. And I remember in, um, this is a, an old copy of Beat Instrumental from 1976, mu Musicians. Uh, magazine, I'll have you know. And there's a review in here and it says, living as I do on the first floor flat, the sounds emanating from my living room stereo are quite audible in the street down below. One bright afternoon, just after I'd see this album for review, I was sitting at home, windows open with side two blaring out at about 50 watts when a couple of kids were wandering along the street underneath. And I distinctly heard the words, Christ, that's Blackmore, isn't it? It's that sort of album, easily recognised blast from Richie Blackmore. Uh, and, and that says it all really, because getting home from the, getting home on the bus, I'm putting this on, going upstairs, got my stereo, putting the needle down. The first track uh, was Tarot Woman. And the thing about the way that rock music Real, real rock music or epic rock music, music that was going to make, you just knew was going to make an impression and it was just going to be massive. Tarot Woman starts with this 
slow synthesizer keyboard solo that just builds and a, a, a lot of bands did this you know the intro tape before the band came on stage there'd be some keyboard intro before you knew there was a guitar riff going to happen and this started like that and so the anticipation was i just knew before anything happened i thought this is going to be awesome i was excited um it's hard to explain but the excitement was tangible. It was Richie Blackmore. It was the cover looked like this. It was his second album. You know, Deep Purple had imploded. You know, you know the Led Zeppelin album hadn't lit the set the the, the world on fire, and this had come out. I was Richie Blackmore back in the UK, and as the keyboard solo builds and it starts to roll into that held note, and you hear right in the background. And you know it's you know it's you know it's Blackmore. It's just one note on one string, just literally backwards and forwards on the plectrum. But you knew that is Richie Blackmore. You just knew, and the way it was building up, and the drums, and it was coming, and you just knew this is going to be fantastic. And everything just comes in: the keyboards, the drums, the bass, and we're and we're off and running with a song called Tarot Woman, and. Dio comes in with the vocals and it's a revelation. Um, I'd seen him with Elf supporting Deep Purple two years before on the Burn tour. I've got Richie Blackmore's Rainbow and I thought he was a great vocalist. But what had happened to him in just the last few months, he, his voice was like, it was just the perfect rock voice for authority, passion, for for sound for a rock voice that sounded huge and that the chorus and the the chorus on tarot woman and the way and that it was just brilliant and the the guitar solo the the keyboard solo they inter into into with itself it's just one of the best songs as an opener for an album superb six six minutes worth of of just brilliance now, Run With The Wolf uh, is a kind of almost, I, I remember I think some reviews said it was almost bad company, which is not really, because you've got Dio. Um, but, it, but it's a kind of stop-start, you know, rock, classic rock, UK-based um, British rock. And it's a good song. And Dio really gets his, his jaws around the, the, the lyrics and he, and he sounds again authoritative you know great sounding drums and, and Cozy Powell is just you know think about it for, for many of us in the UK Cozy Powell was known as he'd done a few pop singles really and unless you were following Cozy Powell he was kind of he wasn't seen as like that set of um, Bill Bruford's and Ian Pacey's and John Bonham's but here you realise that you know hiding in plain sight was one of the best um, drummers on the planet. Starstruck was written about a stalker, a female stalker that followed Blackmore around the world. I think she was called Mariam, I think. I think she was French. And it was a great song, and you could tell that was probably going to be a single, perhaps, and it was. And then the last track on side one was Do You Close Your Eyes, which had no guitar solo, which was a something that was very notable then and also do you close your eyes when making love it was a kind of song a kind, almost a, a love song they did this live and he did have a guitar solo and it was the track where he used to smash his guitar to smithereens but a great track great vocal but going back to coming home on the bus what was apparent was on side two there were only two tracks and even though playing side one was fantastic at the back of my mind was what is going to be on side two because when you look at cd nowadays unless it says the timings it's just tracks isn't it but on vinyl if it only had two tracks on it that meant something spectacular was probably going to happen because most songs pop songs are two well three minutes long rock songs are about six or seven so for there only be two tracks on a side meant that something epic was going on here and in the Land vinyl, for those of you 
who know about stuff like this, you can also tell from the vinyl record where one track starts and one ends again, not like the CD, it just says two tracks. I mean, you could have one song that's that's 15 minutes long and, and the second track is four minutes. But on this, it was obvious from the way that they could see the split between the two tracks of both of them were going to be pretty long. The other thing with vinyl was, you know, for those of you who, who look at it now will remember it, you could look at the grooves and work out if there was going to be quiet or loud. If it was quieter, the, there'd be kind of like a, 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 a kind of less intense area of the grooves. They would look at a different shade of black. And there were no light bits here. So this was obviously intense. Whatever these two tracks were like, they were intense. And so I, I turned it over and sat down on the edge of the bed and put that needle, started the rumble in. And it starts with a, a drum roll from Cozy Powell using a motif he used on, and then there was skin from the B-side of Dance with the Devil. It's a motif he used quite often. And then we have a dark, brooding riff that comes in that is Stargazer. And it just sets the tone. It sets the tone for knowing that what you're listening to is just epic. I know the word epic is used over and over again, but go back to 1976 and this is rolling out of your speakers and there is nothing else like it. The only thing that had a similar feel was Kashmir by Led Zeppelin, but this was just guitar centric and also it was just dense and powerful and meaningful. It was a song about a wizard now, I've never met a wizard. I don't know if they work in Sainsbury's or where they go. And we'd had songs by Sabbath called The Wizard and The Wizard by um, Uriah Heep. And by 1976, that kind of Tolkien-esque kind of wizardry was probably feeling tired, perhaps, but not here. Ronnie James Dio made you believe totally in, <laughs> in wizards. They might as well live next door to you. Um, his voice, the lyrics, and the fact that they, the fact they put the lyrics to this one song in the cover meant that this was not a normal song. And you know, high noon, I'd sell my soul for water. Some years worth, you know, breaking up, uh, uh, breaking my back. The, 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 the lyrics, they just, they just rolled forward like a story, like a, like a before Lord of the Rings, before Game of Thrones. It was that kind of imagery the image and again this this cover you just knew it was about this it was about this guy and the bottom um left hand side of the cover and you know where is your star well you know and all, I, I could you read them out but i'm not going to i don't want to tell too but every line was like it's just perfect but as it went through each kind of layer of riffs the vocals and that that the vocal sound that was captured here by martin birch was just amazing there was a feeling like was it going to get faster is it going to pull back is it going to get slow it doesn't it keeps this groove which is a real kind of eastern um they call it the richie blackmore's kind of uh middle east kind of snake charmer guitar scale and when the i think he wrote it on a cello actually but when he when the solo comes, it just rolls and this groove underneath the guitar solo just keeps going and the drums and the keyboard layering underneath. And the solo is just absolutely out of this world. It's just ripping and shredding across it. And it's just Richie. And I'm, I'm trying to think back to exactly I can. In fact, I can. I can remember hearing this for the first time. I can remember getting up from the edge of the bed in my bedroom and looking across the, the record player to see where we were in it and I could see that we were just barely halfway through and this was just so intense I just didn't want it to end and the guitar, uh, we come to the climax of guitar solo which is amazingly just Richie sends his slide right up to the top of the neck and live uh, I nearly passed out it was so loud and and then we come back into that last that last um that last verse, which I think is just absolutely 
absolutely echoing. We've got all eyes see the figure of the wizard as he climbs to the top of the world. No sound as he falls instead of rising, time standing still. Then there's blood on the sand. Oh, I see his face. And then we go into that other riff. It's just absolutely amazing. Where was your star? Was it far? Was it far? Was it far? And the other thing about Dear at this point is that he improvises like a lot of vocalists do, but the, what, the words he improvised were so powerful and delivered with such passion that they become part of the song. Even many years later, when we listen to it and we listen to the outplay of Stargazer, you know the ad-libs. You know them as if they're part of it. Um, the same way that when um, Blackmore put Rainbow back together recently and David wrote, as he was, Romeo doing the vocals, he had to do the same ad-libs because they're, they're ingrained, they're, they're in. But the line, of course, the line that's... Um, is, is not here, it's actually, I see a rainbow rising out there on the horizon. And as he says that, you just again look at the cover and the violins come in from the Munich um, Philharmonic Orchestra and it just takes the song to a place that you just cannot. There's so much going on, you, you just don't know what to do with yourself. It's just absolutely amazing. And it fades out and you want it to go on forever. You want to know that there'll be a version somewhere where they just kept it running, but there isn't. Not that I know of anyway. And then it ends and you think, now what? What's going to happen next? And within seconds, we're into a light in the black. And if, if, the, if Stargazer did it, then this track, then this track just cemented it all. Um, Within a few minutes, Richie Blackmore is going to be back at the top of the mountain with a wizard. Um, at the top of his game with no one else to touch him. Everyone else seemed to be faltering from this era, but not him. This was the moment. It comes in with a very simple but fast riff and we're off and probably one of the fastest um, songs featuring Richie Blackmore. I know that Kill the King wasn't that far away in the distance, but this was it. And again, the vocal. The vocal from Ron James Dio, you know, when he sings, I'm going at the end of each chorus, I'm, you know, I'm coming home. And it's just the, the, the reverb and the power, the sheer power and the whole, the, you know, the bass, the, the, the drums, the guitars, the keyboards. This is a, a song of such ferocity and such power. And you know that you just knew that this is going to feature a guitar solo that is going to be epic. Again, I'm using that word a lot because this is an epic album. And I think I can use that word. Awesome, epic, whatever you want to say, legendary. Um, there's two verse, the verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And then we go we go into a, a keyboard solo. We've got like a neoclassical kind of burn type keyboard and guitars playing, you know, lots of like, you know, classical tinged uh, motifs and stuff. And then when we go into the, well, actually, I was thinking, ooh, are we going to have guitar solo first or a keyboard solo first? I just knew there was going to be both, but I didn't know which one. It starts with a keyboard solo, which in a way is the right thing to do because it, it sets up the anticipation that whatever Blackmore's going to do, it's going to have to beat Tony Carey. Because Tony Carey was a new name. Um, but on the solo on this with a great synthesizer solo, and then we have the double bass drumming from Cozy Power, which makes the song like full on, you know, almost like speed metal, really. Um, but it's still proggy and absolute rock. And the keyboard solo is just intense. The drumming is intense and everything about it. And then we come out of that and again, we have the, the, the classical kind of like triplets and, and little mouthless, again, very burnish and stuff uh, in, from purple. And then we know, you know, you know we're going to go into the guitar solo. And I could just sense, I was so, I, again, I'm so excited. I'm hearing this for the first time. I've no way of knowing what was coming. This is like an experience of listening to music where I've not read a review, I've not heard it, I've not. There's no online thing. There's no one to talk about it. This is this is just you and the grooves on the record in your room on your own as you hear this music entering your ears and your body and affecting you emotionally for the first time. And it kind of turns that corner when you know this is it now. The guitar is gonna be a guitar solo, whatever it is, it's not gonna be another verse, it's going to be the guitar solo. And it starts, 
it's at full tilt and he just comes in with those couple of notes and you just think oh yes i just know that and he because it's when when the backing of a music is that fast it's very easy for it just to sound like a mush um and it's not easy to put together a guitar solo that features melody and discipline and that and weaves in amongst what is really a, just an intense background but blackmore does it and yes he does he does fire off um you know guitar notes faster than a cash dispenser on a saturday night uh, for, at that time and and but but it, it it's it's played with such authority this and it just to me my thoughts of him being my favorite guitarist in the world he was absolutely my favorite guitarist of all time at this point the, the the guitar solo is just intense the whole song is the way the keyboards are just going and it's just so powerful this is the most this is like music can be like this rock music can be like this in 1976 it's not run out of ideas it was just amazing and and as we come out of the guitar solo is that kind of like a melody that um, Tony Carey joins in with and you just know we're going to go into the verse in a minute and we do and again we have the, the classical kind of dueling between Tony Carey and Chi Blackmore and then we enter the last verse and again the way Dio comes in it sounds so powerful so amazing and we leave we leave the last chorus and you think we're going to have a big anthemic over the top ending and we do you know there's a Blackmore pushes down on his tremolo arm as that note falls back in the background and Dio says I'm coming on way back home and he just does that vocal ad lib that just soars up and out of the speakers and across your head into the and just fills the space that you're in and we're done in eight minutes and about 11 seconds absolutely incredible and I think I, I think I'll safely say that I was exhausted I played at a fair volume for my find my fairly reasonable Hitachi music center and nowadays you'd be on your phone and say telling all your friends oh, I've, I've, I've just played the new rainbow album and it's just amazing then there's no social media there's no internet and you don't even know a few phone numbers but I remember trying to get through to one of my friends and to, to, to say have you, have you heard it have you played it yet what, what do you think and I couldn't get through it was engaged and it was because he was trying to ring me and 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 that and that night going <laughs> to the pub and saying, have you have you played it? And everyone, everyone just talk just talking about side two, and just people were just just talking about it. I was in a band, just my first band then, obviously very young, and we we'd um, we booked like a rehearsal room not far from where we lived, and we didn't play any music that night because all we did was talk about Rainbow Rising, because all of us had got it and we were just talking about it. Perhaps thinking was it even worth trying? Should we just give up? Um, the, the, it was just, it was just incredible, and I just played it and played it and played it. I played I got Tarot Woman and I turned it over to side two, and I think that became the way it was. And if I if I needed a pickup, um, because I was uh, I went to college, but I was working in factories for most of the time. I was I was an apprentice, but I'd come home after being in a factory all day and I just put side two on I just literally put side two on turn it up and that that that's protected me and saved me and in the in the walking around the factory the next day I'd have um Dio's ad libs going around in my head I, I just I just felt the music so this was kind of May June time wasn't it I think 76 in September of course, the whole focus was on going to see um, Rainbow. Uh, I'll go through the, I'll go through this. Um, I have done before because mine's autographed by Robert Plant. It's a separate story, but there's a link below. And uh, the, the program was 65p. T-shirts were two pound thirty. The badge was 45p. Was it? Have I got that right? Yeah, it was. So it was 20p more for the program. Interesting. Um, but but yeah, so that was. That was fantastic. So oh, let's let's just go through some of that stuff now, so I can tell you which 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 version I like. So we'll just dive into that. So here is a look at the Rainbow Rising uh, material that I have. Um, this is my 
original vinyl album which I bought on release, queuing up in Virgin Records with many others to get this. And I've done a separate video, as you know, on the cover by, by Ken Kelly. And I just think it's one of the most fantastic album covers of all time. I also think that's one of the best portraits of a band of all time. It just, everything about this, the way it was put together, some of the best lyrics of a song about a wizard of all time, everything about it is kind of perfect, really. Um, you know, the, the portrait shots on the back. Uh, mine was on the original um, Oyster label. Um, so it was still being put out, I think, under... Deep Purple overseas uh, was still the publishing company, so the Deep Purple machine was still connected to all the all the members of, of Deep Purple, really, ex-members, rather. Um, and in this beat instrumental from July 1976 was the, if I can find it, the album review that I've read from earlier. Um, you can see it was 76 was a great time. You got the Street Walkers, Aerosmith, Johnny and Edgar Winter, Jacko Pastorius up here, Uri Heap. I mean, there was a lot going on in 1976, but that was the review that kind of cemented it really for me, because it was from a Muso magazine. And then in September, I went to see them, bought the badge. I didn't bother with the t-shirt. Perhaps I should have done. Mind you, it probably wouldn't fit now, would it? Um, and they were supported by Stretch. So it was September the 11th when I went to see them. Um, I remember devouring this and talking with my friends about what we thought of the portraits and did Rishi Blackmore look old? I think he was only about 29, wasn't he? Um, Ronnie James Dio, Cozy Powell, Jimmy Bain, um, Tony Carey, um, and the big shot of the rainbow. And all about the equipment that the band had, a review from a, from the States, some colour pictures, great picture of Richie there. And there's a separate video about how come my programme was signed by Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, who also walked me to the bus to help make sure I got home safe after I tried to meet Richie Blackmore backstage. We'd seen Robert Plant um, waiting in the wings, dressed as if he was in this song remains the same as a rock star. So that's a separate video, which the link is at the end of this one. CDs, this is the first one I bought, um, which was, I think, the first um, CD release, Preston, Germany, which again was just minimalist. Same picture there, nothing really else in there. It was, uh, as it say, digitally remastered by Dennis M. Drake, Polydor Studios, and that was it. Um, the one to buy, the one I recommend, is the two CD, um, two CD set, deluxe edition, when they still came with these outer sleeves. This has got fold out panels, great pictures of Richie. And Ronnie on that side and behind the discs are some more pictures of the band live from that period. So this is the deluxe edition and there is a booklet hiding here somewhere. Good reproduction of the artwork on the front. Picture here with that picture Richie Blackmore's from Deep Purple, I would bet on. Um, nice story about the how the album came together with some memorabilia from foreign singles. And then you've got some the credits again at the end. That picture's in the middle panel as well. And then you've got the, what you have here is the New York mix and the Los Angeles mix. Which one is best? It's just personal. You have to listen to both and decide. And then the only bonus tracks are rough mixes of all the tracks. There are no extra tracks done. You've got Stargazer done as a rehearsal. That's an interesting to listen to. Um, and all the credits are there. And it says here, the product, here you've got Carol Stevens from Blackmore's Night was involved by this time and remastering was by Andy Pierce, who does a fantastic job of that. So that's the one I would recommend is the two CD set or try and find, of course, 
an original vinyl version. So that's the merch, the album, the t-shirt, the CD, whatever, um, you know, which one I, I recommend you buy. But it was a great gig. You've got to think, again, just a few months after hearing this for the first time, seeing Richie Blackmore. And again, to, to emphasise this, there's no, there's no YouTube or internet. You didn't see your idols move unless you saw them live. Whereas now you go onto Facebook or something and you just type and you'd see video clips from the tour like, uh, you know, like White Snake are doing their farewell tour and you can see clips every, every night from every gig. Then you had to see some, you had to see your band live. So I hadn't seen Richie Blackmore move in real life since Burn in 74. Um, and so to see your, to see your heroes, they were like mystical beings that came down from a mountain and especially, you know, with something like this. And it was an amazing gig. Um, you know, I'll do Rainbow on stage as a separate video, but it was an amazing gig. And, you know, I saw Stretch and great, you know, great band, but everyone just wanted to see Richie Blackmore and this new band that surrounded him, you know, with Cozy Powell and Tony Carey, Jimmy Bain and Ronnie James Dio. And I was right down the front and it was just amazing. And the version of Mistreated was just colossal. Dio just nailed it and made it his own. But Stargazer, you know, you think, how are they going to do it? And then, you know, how are they going to do that song? Um, you know, because of the, the epicness of it, but they did. And it was just, um, it was just fantastic. So this album is, has to be filed under every home should have one. It sums up, you know, the, this period of, of rock music I can't really say it's so the word like heavy metal or whatever, but uh, and I don't really want to keep using the phrase classic rock when I've said that it's all just rock music. But if 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 any of you are watching this who are younger viewers uh, and you and you want to and you want to know where to dip into, then this is a great place to start. Seriously, it is one of the finest albums um, of the rock idiom. I think you can possibly expose yourself to. So thank you very much for watching and listening and thank you all of you for all of your support and for sharing my videos and for subscribing and for being around when I do them and thanks also to my patrons who help just that little bit more to give me the um, confidence and also the time to produce more videos like this. It really does make a difference. So thank you very much, stay safe, keep spinning those records and I shall see you on my next video.